Okay, Ali, the, uh, you, you've just spoken about the 99, the 99 World Cup. Um, South Africa went into quite a... There was another year of Nick Mallet. Uh, and then South Africa went into quite a sort of weird period where, where things went a bit pear-shaped. And I can't remember if you stayed... How long you, you stayed as, uh, in the box in that period because they went from Mallet and then they went Harry Fulion. Um, and then straight into into Australia. Did did you play under Harry? Yeah, yeah, I played under Harry. Did, uh, of course you did. I remember. I remember you being in that. We went to Ireland and Argentina yeah, and that, yeah, that yeah, game yeah. where they where they weren't allowed to kick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's what I want to tell you. What's amazing is is uh, Harry and I played under uh, Australia, and it's very interesting if you, if you look at everything. Okay, so when. When we meet after 99, we came back in 2000. And yeah, there was big shit because uh, I remember the one, I think, you know, I don't know who it was from, that phoned me and asked me for an interview. And it's just, and I remember I still said, you know what, if Nick Mallet can honestly look at the world and say it was the right thing to, to, to pick Bobby above Gary Titan, then, then, then so be it. But I truly believe he can't say that. So I got a phone call from Alex. Remember Alex, um, the, the media? Yeah, Alex Brun. Yeah. And he, his words as follows, as follows. Nick Mallet says, you must shut the fuck up and keep your big mouth shut. You don't say a word or you won't have a contract next year. Okay. So I'm going, okay. You know, I didn't say, I just said, if he can honestly say he, might, he did the right thing, I, I think he made a mistake. Yeah. Pitch up at the Springbok camp next year. And what does Nick Mallet do? Yeah, we go hard and they've got, and now the Stormers are the king ding a lings now because they did well. And, you know, they've got this fitness test that we've never done. So we do this test. So I didn't do too well in the fitness test. And uh, and uh, the next minute, I, get a, I must be at the field at half past five the next morning. Pitch up there and they had a full on uh, fitness session for me. Okay, and I never knew it, but he said, if that, in his words, if that fat fucking oak doesn't make it up to that point there, then uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm sending him home. Okay, and so it's fine. So you go, and, and we had a very tough year with the Sharks because that's when Magna also left. So we had, so it was a very tough year with the Sharks, but we were actually played good rugby. We were just not a good team. And they brought a lot of new players in. Gary and them had left. So it was a very similar, just a tough time there. You know, and as young guys, if you don't have good leadership there, it's very hard. And um, I just remember we did like this fitness session and, and uh, me and Albert van der Berg was doing it. And Albert van der Berg would run the whole day like a flipping bundle. Yeah. And the next minute, he, I, I had to make a certain cutoff. And, had, and I made my cutoff. If you have to make it, I make it, no matter how hard it is. And we did another fitness test. And I said, okay, I'm a, you do tackles, as many tackles as you can, and say in, in a minute. And he had two bags a meter apart. So you had to tackle up, tackle up, tackle up. So I remember Sorry still looked at me and said, yeah, Robbie Kempson can do... Uh, 35 of these so you better make sure you do 25 and so I said yeah no 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 try my best I think I did uh, 42 okay so now they're quite fucked because I ran this long distance and, and I made it and they were thinking yes because Robbie was now the guy that they were all going at and they were going yes okay yeah I beat Robbie with the, with the different because we had different skill sets at the shot so he called me and I had to do fitness there for the next six weeks on my own two times a day hour and a half with Phil Mac, you know, and then uh, Warren Brosnan still said, yes, well, I've never seen it, I've not complain and just shut up and do what he had to do, you know, so I did it. And, uh, and then Mick, Nick called me off because he didn't expect me to make this fitness test. So he said, Oli, you know what? Uh, you must keep your big mouth shut. Okay, you must play rugby. Okay, and we were going to send you home, but no, we can't really do that. And, uh, and then his words were to me the following, you know what? You'll see James Dalton's not here. And you'll see uh, Chris Rousseau's not here. It's my last season, and I'm telling you now, I've decided I only pick guys that I like in this team. If you're a bit of a, if you're a doist, I'm not picking you. So I've picked guys. And I looked at him, and I remember I was, I was thinking, so yes, Nick, you know what? We gave you the right to pick guys that you like and not the best team to play for South Africa. And as soon as a coach goes into that space where he went there, you just never, you don't trust him at all. You know, you just back off and you say, okay, I'm fine, I'll do all it. And that whole season was always this team that we did everything he wanted us to do and we played hard and we looked happy and we just didn't give a shit about Nick Mallet because he was just totally out of line. We, we couldn't trust him. So my, what must I do? Who must like me now? You or your wife? Or, or, or you know, do I have to be a likable guy to be picked for the spring box? You know what I'm saying? I don't have to be liked. All I have to do is between the four white lines, my opponents must fear me and my teammates must respect me. And outside the four white lines, I must not disrupt the team in a, in a bad way, you know? And, and he went on that whole long the coach, you know, and it's just a fighting part. He holds your money, you know, he could manipulate you like that. So, and I remember 
that picked up on Boon that year and uh, we lost against the English year and then we went overseas and, and you know, one thing you must never drop Mark Andrews or mess with his money because Mark Andrews he counts the cents and then yeah, that pisses him off so Nick got Mark and that's why I got so much respect for Mark Nick picked him so we went overseas and Mark arrived there and we played but he just gave us a bit of he just brought that Mark Andrews where the, the opposition goes oh shit this is going to be tough and I remember we still came on this one field uh, in, in, in Australia. And as Mark ran on the field, Nick Mallard was standing there and he like pushed him and he said, hey, Mark, you yeah? know? And Mark lined him up. He pulled up. He says, come, come, you fucking gun. Come, you touch me again, I'll kill you. And he was ready to roll. The coach right there. <laughs> okay, right. Yes, this is Mark. You're a fucking legend, you know? Yeah. But that's how angry he, he didn't. He, and, and, and that same guy in 1998, have, I remember Gary still went and Jake White came running onto the field. And he said, Gary, Gary. The coach wants to know, who must he pull off? Mark or Craner? And Gary stood there and he looked behind him and Mark and Craner was looking at him. What's he going to say? And he says, I'll tell you later. <laughs> because they would kill for, to play for that guy. And just by his, the way he treated them, they, and, and if you play for, it sounds funny, if you play for the Springboks, you, you play for your coach and for your country. But if you don't play for your coach, you can play still hard and look well, but, but it doesn't really mean much. And, and the last game we played that year, we played uh, at Ellis Park. And we played, uh, Nick gave that bad comment uh, against, uh, with the Aussie game, with the tickets. So then, the Aussie is in Durban. It was in Durban yeah, that game. Durban, so yeah. we played that one. And then the next game we played at Ellis Park. Ellis Park was just before. That was the flaky test. That was the week before. Yes, yeah, was, was the week before. Okay, so it was the other way around. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I remember a corner Krieger still trying to steal a ball coming off the yeah. bench and they kicked yeah. it in the last minute, the, the, the next thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And still in Mortlock. But uh, and that, that game against the All Blacks, I remember we beat them 44 and I watched it the other game. Yes, it was a beautiful game. And then we came into the change room. So I was like, yes, I'm happy. So I was the first guy into the change room. Yeah, and now. So all this year, all this shit Nick Mallard gave me, yeah, he so grabs me and he hugs me and she, yeah, Oli, yeah, well done. Like, Thanks, coach. You know, as I go, I like, look back and Mark comes in and I promise you, Nick Mallard goes, hey, Mark, how you going? Mark and just gives him a two-handed in the chest. Says, Fuck off. Don't ever touch me again. Turns around and walks to his change room. But he played flat out. If you look at Mark played, my friend, for the, he played for the Springboks. But he never, ever trusted Nick Mallard again. Never, Nick Mallard lost he lost the, 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 the guys that got him there. Then here comes Harry. Harry Fulhune. He comes with his whole Mark Q. Hand. Oh, it's never played a game in his life. Suddenly we have to send emails. At 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, they have to have our emails. <laughs> Even today, if you're not set up with emails, it's a bit of frightening. With our polar heart rates at the taken like this and like that and we had to wear Gucci clothes and all this nice, you know, which, which was awesome because he wanted a certain look that he wanted and Markov was behind Harry and Harry had this vision of us playing this new whole game and, and, and he was getting the best skills guys in so, so he was doing it right but yes, he was just, he was just, he was he didn't build up to going 100 50 miles an hour. He just went from 0 to 150 in one day. You know? okay. We were still in plate and the next minute, you know, we had a 6 o'clock session in the morning. We had a 9 o'clock field session till 12. Then we had a media session till 1. Then we could eat till half past 1. Then 2 o'clock, we had to be on the field. Then we had a fitness session. After three weeks, I still remember I went to all the uh, under Fenter's room and he said, Oli, nobody can train like this. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. We were just train and train and train. Got to a stage, heart rates came. We hit to Durban. And the next minute, all the heart rates told us we totally overtrained. So it was amazing. He said, we totally overtrained. So the guy that from Polo went to Harry, he says, Harry, these guys, you've got to give them up. So Harry says, no, you can see. He says, well, you said we want to be the most scientific. I'm telling you now, these guys are overtrained. So Harry, for you, had to give us four days off the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Cape Town before we played the All Blacks. Yes. Have you ever seen a bus erupt? <laughs> I mean, his whole planning, because he said we're going to be this team, but he still stuck to it. Eh? And, and, and he gave us off and we lost that test just because Percy was kicking like a spray gun again. You know, and if he had just kicked, we would have won that test comfortably. And then they brought Brown from starting back. Yeah. So at the end of the year, Mark Croft is still is brought back in. So we're going. So Harry says, guys, listen to me. Simple. We're going to be the best team in the world. We're not going to kick. So we look at him. So what do you mean we're not going to kick? He says, we're not going to kick. He says, we're going to kick to pass. Yeah, we can kick to pass, but we're not kicking. But why? He says, because we're going to play with the ball in hand and we're not going to give the other side the ball. We said we're the best going to be. So the guys look and say, but can we kick when we're in the five yards? He says, I said, we're not going to kick. You understand me? So we go, okay. 
coach has a plan, you're not going to kick. So we're playing these Argentinas and we don't kick the ball. We just keep running at them, keep running at them. They eventually so tired, their tongues are hanging out, they're stuffed. And we, we say 33 points to 15 ahead or 12, but they are stuffed and we just play, play. But the next minute they realize we're not kicking. So all they do is we, you know, we five yards from our try line and we're just not kicking. And so they just put everybody up there, you know. So now you've got this line that you just, it's like a practice with the, yeah. and we just, and we can't get away from our five yards. And I remember Mark, I was sitting next to uh, Harry. He said, Harry, what's what's cool? Harry said, it's nice cool. We're not going to kick. He said, Harry, what's what's cool? said, we're not going to kick. We're not going to kick. And you can see Harry shaking, no, no. And I think on 72 minutes, he sent the message down. It's all right, kick, kick, kick. And Percy took the ball and he kicked it. And they came back and we won 36-33 because they suddenly got their hands on the ball. And not one player ever believed Harry for you again because he didn't believe himself. And that was the end of his coaching career. You and he didn't me. understand that, 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 that day, that the Argentinian test, because the players said, but, but you told us we're not going to kick. And he backed off on his own belief. If he had stuck with that, even if we had lost that game, he would have had players that believed in him to an nth degree. But that one thing, and what's amazing, I saw him a while ago at Chevy Beach Club, and he was sitting there, and I walked up to him, and we had a lucky conversation. I said, you know, you know when, you, when, you, when you lost the team? Not all the stuff that you did. It was actually the right way because the world is moving that way. You were just way ahead of it. But that day when you didn't believe yourself, and that day we stopped believing in you. And that was the end of Harry. So now I'm with Harry and we're going ballistic, so I pitch back at the Sharks. But now who's at the Sharks? It's Australia. <laughs> so Australia now is my good friend Chris Rousseau, and he's made him captain of the team. So we're going hard, and I arrive, and they all look at me and say, Oli, you can be glad you're not having been here because Australia is going old school. Got army drills, all that stuff. And thank goodness you got so they, they did all that Kamstaldrat shit. The Sharks did a year before, long before all the, the Kamstaldrat happened. We did it at the Sharks. So we went and we played. And yes, we had that great season with the Sharks and, and, and the guys were playing well. But Australia had the same problem as Rolf. They always try and think what you're thinking and then what you, how you're going to react and how they're going to get you to do what they want you to do. But by thinking how you're going to... So they, they were like totally out of... You know, and, and, and we had that great run with the Sharks when we had to play the Queensland Reds. So he rested everybody. But it was a 10-day turnaround instead of yeah. playing them that game. Yeah. You know, and then we lost that game. And then the next game, we hit the flipping Crusaders. They were waiting for us. But you know, he just, he, he just, he, his ideas were good. But he, I don't know, he just lacked somehow to understand the, the, um, what it took, you know. And, and we got to the final that year. And, and if you look back, uh, you know, the, the Brummies were a very smart team. And uh, we did well, but if James, uh, Butch James just kicked his kicks in the first half, I think we would have been leading. He missed four kicks. Uh, and, and unfortunately, they, they caught us with two easy tries. And uh, from there, uh, Nick uh, Australia went. But then uh, Harry got, uh, Harry just said, I've had enough of this, and he left. So now Australia came in. So now you've got Australia, and he was playing, buying into this whole um, playing expansive game and everything. And the next moment, we're playing the Bulls at Loftus. And I think we, we lost the game, but it wasn't a good game. It was, uh, Heineke was just having that pick and go, flip and in the 15 yards with the whole team and just smash the guys down. Kevin Putt made the mistake to, I think I went off, I'd made 18 tackles and every one of them was a plus two meters offensive. And he took me off for Edward could see and they just started getting meters and eventually the Bulls won the game. It was such, uh, it wasn't good rugby. And, and as I came up, I saw a real strike. I said, hey, Rolf, how's it going? He said, no, good. Yeah. I said, yes, sir, you mustn't be too impressed with that game. He looked at me and said, one of the best rugby games I've watched in a long while. I looked at him, I thought, yes, you know, this is weird because that's, that's not what you told us a while ago. So I was a bit nervous. What, what was he going to do here? Because you could hear something. And, uh, and he just went off. And then when he got to the box side, he didn't want to pick any of the Sharks players that got him. You know, he got John Smith and the guys, but it was amazing. He never, like what Kitch did, he picked his, his core of his Transvaal guys that backed him and believed him. And Australia just used us as a step up. And, and, and we had a bit of a... Uh, uh, not an altercation. He, uh, he unfortunately uh, played badly when he got there. I think he lost badly against the, uh, the Australians. Because just before Richard Brand scored that nice try, it was the test before that, he got hammered by the Aussies. And he got uh, hammered by the Aussies by New Zealand, actually. That was the Jan van Riebeck test. 
You're talking about... Yeah, yeah, but they played two in a row or something, but, but it was yeah. just before the okay. Richard Banks... The Aussies, the Aussies won in, in Australia. Sorry, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah they won, but, but, but we played bad. It was like a big score. And I, and the one, I don't know who phoned me and asked me for a comment, and I said, yes, uh, one thing I know is uh, Australia will definitely not build the World Cup. He will struggle to make the semi-finals and rather fire him now and get somebody else in because with the way we're playing and what he's doing, it's definitely not going to work. You know? Because not that I'm just saying it because I'm, I'm pissed off that he didn't pick me. He could pick the guy called Christoph, somebody that played one game for Namibia or somebody, a Bulls uh, lucid above me. He was never in my, in my class, you know. But, but he just did the wrong thing. He picked the wrong guys, not guys that got him there, you know. And, and, uh, and uh, he sent me a message uh, saying, listen, I'll hunt you down. You know, and I said, no, it's fine. What are you going to take away my birthday, my friend? You know, I don't care. Come on, you know, you know where I live. This is my address. You're welcome. And then Nike delivered a pair of golf clubs for him. <laughs> it was the best thing ever. So it's like, Ollie, and they got me some golf clubs. I was a Nike sponsored athlete. And, uh, and they brought these clubs to me. I said, why don't you just give this to Rulf? I said, no, it's fine. I'll give it to you. So I waited. And please God, uh, his secretary phoned me. Hello, Ollie, uh, listen here. Would you mind giving us uh, uh, Rulf's golf club? I said, no, no. Tell him, here's my number, here's my address, this is where I live, the golf clubs are here. I'm, I'd like to have a conversation with him about his message that he sent me. Till this day, he's never ever fetched his golf clubs, and one of my friends are playing beautifully with him now. <laughs> so it's amazing how the coach, uh, it's amazing how the coach, and it's not about, I don't believe it's, I know Rolof, he's a, he's a good guy, he's a guy that, that I played with, and, but being a coach, having this power, just makes them go, it, like the wires just cross. And that's what's so amazing about Rossi, about Mac, about Nick when he started, is, is somewhere it gets corrupted. And, and, and a guy like Rossi, he just loves the game so much. I think if you can't coach, you'll die because you can't analyze the team. And, 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 but, but that true core of, 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 of the guys just go, hey, well, they think they've got to be the savior. So an SA rugby, every time allows them to have all that power. You know? And a guy like Peter de Villiers, I believe he was one of the best coaches. If I look at his teams afterwards, he's really a good coach. But his support system around him was just never good enough. And, and that's where the All Blacks are so far ahead of us because they, they have all the players. They have players sitting around and always make the right decisions for the All Blacks. You know? But uh, that was amazing with Australia. You know, the Sharks got him there and he was looking. He never picked any of the Sharks players for his Springbok side. He, he, he backed the Bulls. And that's, it was like... And, and, and you've got to believe in that your coach, you know. And uh, then that whole Cam Stoddart thing, you'll notice I wasn't that Cam Stoddart, Mark Andrews wasn't that Cam Stoddart, and Bobby Skinstad wasn't that Cam Stoddart. Because <laughs> uh, the, the three of us, there's just no way that would have worked. There's just no way. And thank goodness I wasn't there because I believe uh, it, 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 it was tough. And, and, and the sad thing is, if I look back at my career, the saddest thing, and where I judge myself the most, is that I didn't stand up at the, and, and I didn't know how to at that stage, is to look at a coach and say, I disagree with you. I don't think this is the right way to do it. And, 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 and when I got to Rusty, Michael Checker was another guy. Yes, and they, they managed, Mac was good with that as well. They managed that part. Uh, when you went to them and said, we don't, I don't agree with you. They never felt threatened. They always said, but why don't you agree with me? I said, because I'll give you a good example. We had a drill one day. Yeah, I had the biggest fight with Jake White about this draw, okay? We had seven bags, and they all run at you. And, you've got, and they must do switches, and then you must tackle the bag. And there's always one bag that runs late, and you've lined this oak up, and then the bag comes through. And then they scream and shout at you, you must stay in your line and defense. And said, you know, I was committed, yeah, and nah. So eventually I looked at I looked at uh, Jake, I said, Jake, but it's a shit draw. And he said, yeah, you always different. I said, no, but he's not seven balls on the rugby field. There's one. So if this ball is here, I'm not worrying about that guy because this is my channel and this is my partner. I can just worry two channels to my left and to my right. I can't worry about five channels. The guys there must communicate if something happens. And he just goes off at me. You're always different. Uh, so I said, okay, fine. She was with the Sharks with all the uh, Uri's that, that year. Yeah. Same thing happens, I get to the cheetah. Same thing happens in our coach. We have the same argument, me and this coach. So the coach now, but now I'm older. I don't like this bullshit anymore, you know. I've had my year at the Sharks. And I look at the, at the coach and I'm telling him, this is a shit drill because you don't be negative at me if your drill doesn't allow it to be a good drill, you know. It's always going to happen. Because I defend the ball. So we're having this conversation and as he comes on, he says, what's going on here? Because he's very tense. He picks up negativity very quickly. And I'm a person that can get very negative. And then I give a very bad vibe to the team because it's just I don't enjoy what I'm doing and I don't understand it. And the next one, he says, what's going on? What's this negativity here? I said, yes, it's Rashi. 
I never defend seven backs. I just defend the ball, okay? And if the ball's there and that back there does a switch, it doesn't matter. I must focus on these, these guys here. This is what I must do. And my oak next to me as well. And he looks at me, looks at the coach. He says, this is a shit drill. Drop the bags. Here's a ball. Play rugby. You understand? And he, and, he, and he never took offense. I know the coach at that stage uh, that was there, he did take offense. Okay? But Rossi was someone that if you challenged him about a system, he would look at you and say, well, I'll give you an answer later. And he'd say, yes, I like it. And then he would be in a team meeting. He'd say, guys, a friend came to me and he told me I'm doing this wrong. And I actually thought about it and he's right. I'm not going to do it this way. From now on, we're doing it this way. But he would never tell you, who this is the yellow. And the same way, he would never do it in a way where he would, he would say, uh, yes, but you're the bad guy as well. No, he, he, had a, he had a way with that. And the good coaches all have a way with, with players that are, that, are, that are intense or passionate to be able to get the best out of them, but manage them without putting them in this box and saying, this is where you have to be, to allow them a voice. Oli, you mentioned Michael Checker just now. Um, that's where you ended your career. You ended your career in Ireland. And I remember when I was speaking to you for my book last year, you, you spoke quite a lot about that. I mean, it sounds, seemed, seemed like in a sort of experience that you ended your career with one of your best experiences. Amazing, amazing. I, to this day, uh, I was, uh, it was just the right fit for me at Dublin and Leinster. And, and what was nice when I went over there, uh, the, the first interview I had, the guy said, yeah, oh, the guys told me you're going to come here for pension. What do you say about that? And I looked at the report, I said, yes, but you must understand one thing. And I had the same conversation with the, the, the MD of the company. He said, oh, we're only giving you a one-year contract because we believe you're here on pension. I said, yes, but you must understand, you, you're going to beg me to stay the second year. Okay, you just made the biggest mistake you ever do because I don't care how much you pay me when I play, I play. Okay, and uh, the same reporter said that to me. And the truth at the end of that year, they actually begged me to stay and they allowed me to travel from South Africa. I was like, <laughs> we travel in and travel out and travel in and travel out for six weeks at a time because mm -hmm. I, my family had to come back to Bloomfontein. But the amazing thing about Cheka and the Irish was it's just to, it was this total different environment, but and the fields are slow and wet. So all that counts then is that the heavier you are, the better. So on these fields, there wasn't all these flipping maoris and oaks running and stepping and going. They just put the ball and ran straight at you <laughs> on a wet field. And it was amazing. I never, uh, I, I never knew about the, the, the Irish's uh, passion, uh, but, but like for the Munster and the, Le the Leinster game, that's like north of us, the south, blue bulls, old days, like you cannot believe. And to be caught up with that and, 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 the, and the players that believe, you know, Michael, playing with Brian O'Driscoll, yeah, people that, like, it's just, I've never seen a player like that. Uh, uh, playing with a guy like Gordon Darcy, this Jonathan Sexton, he couldn't even make the team then because they said he was too young, he still needs to prove himself. Um, Philippe Contaponi, how they thought about the game, listening to a guy like Mike Brewer that was from the All Blacks, uh, David Knox was the backline coach. I was listening, listening to this one. I went to a Noxie the one day. I said, Noxie, man. Because they had this move. I call it the Philippe Contaponi loop, the loop where the, the 10 would pass to the 12. He'd loop around the back. The 13 would come short of the 12. And then he'd either play the 13 or play the, uh, the 10 coming around. Or the 12 would go on its own. So I said, Noxie, how do you guys do that move? Because every time you just pick the right guy and you're in the gap and you and you how, how do you coach a player to be able to see who to pass to he said hey no mate don't fucking coach that it's fucking impossible you pre-call it <laughs> i said what he says you pre-call it you can't fucking coach that but it's way too difficult and i realized we all see these australians and these with those this vision uh, they pre-call the move and it works every single time because they know what they're doing and you don't so you've got a third a 33% chance of guessing right. And, then, and, and you learn so much of how simple this game is, but we've made it so complex through so many people that actually haven't played the game. I get frightened. Listen to me, guys. I'm scared. The people coaching our future players has not played at the highest level at all. Not even close. So what are they coaching? They're just guys that pick players that are big, that are strong, that needs to gym. But they, there's no creativeness and playing in the flow. And, and the best coach at this moment is the great college coach, Vessel de Plessis. He's got a brilliant fitness guy. A year ago, he was complaining they weren't scoring constructive tries and they, were, they weren't playing well. And I looked at him and I said, this is, uh, uh, my lovely personality, uh, being brutal, I said, stop talking total bullshit. 
I said, the only reason, the only team I actually can't wait to watch is Great College. I said, well, do you know what? He says, no. I said, because I've got no idea what the fuck you're going to do next. <laughs> he looks at me and says, what do you mean? I said, every angle other team in the world is overcoached. It's a backline move with a 12 hitting up, with the forwards going around, going around, and then a backline move. You guys, I just have no idea. You trust each other. If your wing, if your prop is on center, he doesn't run around to the right. He stays at center. If they play him, he gives a grab and he runs over the guy. And I said, and the exciting part about the way you guys are playing is you're just playing in the flow and trusting your systems. And it's the best rugby I've ever watched the past three years because there's just a freedom to it within a certain structure and to allow players to do that. And I had a very interesting conversation one day with... Uh, Mark Petrovsky, it was, I remember you'll remember the tribe that England played here yeah, in 2000, well, I'd say seven, uh, no, 2006. And they came in, and John de Villiers still, he, he tapped the ball like on an intercept and he ran and he stepped the one guy, stepped the other guy, did like a turnaround and eventually scored under the posts. And I looked at Mark Whistleson next to me and watched and I said, Mark, how do you coach that? He says, it's impossible to coach that. I said, you're right, but you know you can uncoach that. And he said, what do you mean? I said, by overcoaching a player, the right thing for him would have been at that stage just to go down and place the ball. He would have got 10 stats. But what he did there, you could coach him not to do it, but you cannot coach that. And that's the beauty of this game of rugby. People don't understand it. I don't want to see this little uh, PlayStation TV games. I want to see Colby taking the ball <laughs> and to see all the tight forwards on the other field. The, the pants go slightly brown because Colby's got the ball. You understand? That's what I want to see because you don't know what he's going to do now, where he's going to pitch up. And, and that's the beauty of the game. We great colleges get gotten it right, but we're in, in big trouble if I just look at the people coaching our players that's never played at the highest level. And I believe that's why Rossi had such a major impact because when Rossi sat there, and if he tells you how to go, even to this day, Rossi's drill, but if you're not tackling well, it's simple. You go into a five-meter little uh, grid, and he gets the biggest guys to run at you until you can tackle. And he says, I don't, I don't want you to tackle. You know, say, if it's Oli LaRue and he's tackling uh, uh, a smaller guy, you know, you've got to smash him. But if a smaller guy just makes you, just make your tackle. Show me you've got uh, balls, you know. And, and I believe that's where our, our, the game's really at, uh, becoming very just, it's a boring game. It's becoming, if I watch games, the other I watch games of the 1996, that era, I never knew what happened next. It was a quick game. The guys play, they kicked well, they chased. Nowadays, you know exactly it's going to be up and under. It's going to slow the team down. And I believe that playing in the flow is what we're lacking a lot nowadays. And a big reason for that is because you don't have players that have played. And that's what I learned in Leinster with Noxie. And listen to Mike Brewer, how they just see the game. And we had a big fallout at Leinster the one day. We played to, to, to lose and we lost to them. Yes, and we were playing these brilliant rugby between the 10 yards. Yes, we had 15 phases setting it up and eventually they kicked the ball. So we were watching that, and, and, and Shane Hogan was there, and all these actually, the big, 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 big legends. And the forwards wouldn't say a word, they just keep quiet. And the backs would be shitting all over them. And, you know, I'm not used to this coming from South Africa. So eventually, after this passage of play, I just said, Guys, could you just rewind that quickly? I just want to look at that passage of play again. But then the guys go, and they rewind it. And I said, Just explain to me. We had 15 phases between the 15 to 10 yards. We never went anywhere. Okay. And then you kick the ball. Couldn't you just kick the ball in the first phase? Because that would save me five rucks, four runs, and I would be fresh for the next phase. And Shane Hogan said, yeah, we will not become a kicking team and we will play expansive rugby. And I said, Shane, if you do that, you'll never win a game in your life because it's the most stupid rugby you play. And then I'm fucking off to South Africa because it doesn't make sense. And Mike Brewer came in with me. He says, yeah, guys, we've got to earn the right to play it right. All the other forwards are looking at me like, geez, like, how can you say that to Shane Hogan? I said, well, I, I, I don't like what you say. Luckily, they all went to Ireland. We started playing well, and when they came back, we actually managed to get the balance between just playing rugby or playing strategically well. And that's what you think. If you look at Jonathan Sexton today, what makes him the best fly off in the world? His ability to push you into corners, the way to play the game in the right part. And that, that does, doesn't, a youngster doesn't know that. That gets learned to understanding the game of rugby. And uh, that's why I enjoyed Leinster a lot. You know, Shane Hogan wasn't angry with me after that. In South Africa, we'd be the Marine with each other. We'd take it personal. 
but he listened and then when we changed and and the way those guys the skills that the Leinster guys had been playing in sleet and they would put up a try which would be one-handed flip behind the back scoring in the corner uh, and it, it, it was really a, a great experience and, and I really believe uh, we have to we're missing those players that are playing there in South Africa because those are the guys that were some of the... I played against Julian White. Yeah, then I played uh, uh, the Argentinian uh, test player. So the, the level of the hardness of the, all the players there, it's just under other level. If you look at our Curry Cup, you know, when the Springboks come back, there's immediately life because you just have this... The hard, the, but, but it's, it's a nice, pretty game with under-23s and one or two older guys. But I really, truly really believe... Oh, our place to play is definitely in Europe uh, to make our youngsters hard for the professional game. And I firmly believe we must try and get a... I wouldn't start the Super 12, I know what they're doing, but I would try and get an under-23 competition going as a semi-amateur competition in uh, in Europe because I believe that would blood a lot of our players like an under-23 uh, league. Yes, I think it would be brilliant for, for, for rugby worldwide. I've got one question, Gav. I don't know if you've got how many questions you've got left. Or we get... I, wanted to ask him, I wanted to ask him what, what he was doing what he's doing now. I know what he's doing now, but I mean, that was part of the... But you, you asked the question, Brendan. Okay, I mean, we can always get Ollie back for a second round. I think we can easily do a second <laughs> round. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I touched some of the stories. I, I remember there was a story around about 2005. Um, you guys had played a, a super rugby game down in Cape Town, and Graham Smith, and Andrew Simons oh. were involved in a nightclub, and you, you guys jumped in to defend Graham Smith. Uh, it's, okay, this is the truth that happened. Okay, you know we, we managed to keep that one quiet for a long time, uh, and uh, and it was. But what happened? Uh, we know uh, uh, Sir Simmons had a bit of a drinking problem, and uh, the cricketers. There was a lot of antagonism between the Australian cricketers and. Uh, the South African cricketers, they, they were brutal and shamed. They were just that Aussie arrogance that you just, you know, just, just, it wasn't nice. It was, it was very, very, very bad. So we went out and we met the, we played the game down there. And so we meet, I think Graham and them were staying in our town. said, oh, come out with us and we're going to meet the Aussies. And then they said, but let's give the Aussies a bit of shit, give them a bit of shit and, you know, try and, try and sort them out a bit. So they, because they couldn't do it. So they wanted us to give them a bit of a, you know, just to rag them a bit and stuff. So I was, at the bar, and Simmons was there, but he must have had a drinking problem. So what I was doing, I, I threw 20 tequilas behind me, and I said, come on, have, a, have one, Simmons, have one with me. Cheers, buddy, come. You Australians must say you can drink. Come, 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 drink with the, with the big men now. They're not cricket players. So I was antagonizing him a bit, but Shaman, he was falling for it. The year that we were going, but we were drinking harder. And the next minute, we had a discussion, and I said, you know what? I'll give you five of your best shots. Just don't hit me in the face or in the nuts. But on the sixth one, I'm going to hit you back. And I'm warning you, you're going to get hurt. You know? So, But it was like, a, it was like you know, just nothing serious. You know, so the next one he stands, but he smokes me in the ribs. Poof. Okay. So I look at him and I laugh and I say, that's number one. Okay, you've got five to go. <laughs> so he smokes me again. The second one. So I say, that's two. You've got three more to go. Because normally you stop on four. Because if he doesn't hit me five, I don't have to hit you back, you know. Oh. Yeah, so as he smoked in the third one, he's... Um, so the African Oaks were standing behind him and seeing him hitting me like that. And they were thinking he was, and I'd, I wasn't hitting him back or something. And the next minute, they had a full go at him. Yes. So I was there to jump in and stop them. Said, no, 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 relax, relax, relax. It's not a, not a big issue. You know, we, we're just going around here. And then uh, the Mike Hussey came in and Michael Clark came. And yeah, he's a little dipshit. And he was going, yeah, and he was screaming at me. And I looked at him and I said, Michael, do me a favor. Keep dead quiet and don't say another word because if you say another word, I'm going to knock you out. Okay. And he kept quiet. Michael Asi took me away. They had to actually take Simmons away. So it was a bit of an unfair. Uh, we gutted them a bit into it. And then I met old Michael Asi and what a gentleman. You know? We had a long chat and uh, it was nothing serious. But, but, but after some of the Africans were seeing old Simmons having a full go at me and we were having a big piss up actually, you know, and just laughing about it. And then they climbed in and, and, and then we actually stopped them from, because uh, they were going hard for him. They were going to smoke this oak and we to stop them and then luckily old Michael then took him home and the whole situation got diffused but it was many many tequilas later so we rather <laughs> not, not, not our proudest, proudest moment not our I'm, proudest moment 
I think, yeah, I think just before we end, yeah, tell us what you're doing now and then uh, we can always get you back for a second round so, at some point. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm living in Bloemfontein. I'm very blessed. Uh, my wife, Mariska, that was my, my girlfriend in those days. We're still married and uh, we've got uh, four beautiful daughters. And I'm in the farming, farming and agricultural value chain. Uh, we, we do a lot of business in with like uh, blueberries and and cattle and then uh, and I've, I've got a bit of a development or two that I'm that I'm busy with so trying to uh, survive COVID-19 uh, and that's uh, that's the first major thing and uh, and then yeah just to, to to get my kids to to make it all to get to varsity because then I think I'll have a have a break and uh, yeah but very blessed me in Bloemfontein I say everything everything in the world is big and then Bloemfontein stays average and then everything in the world is small and Bloemfontein is still average so we just uh, we have a great community here and then it's been very very good for, for me and my family and uh, yeah it's been a great chatting to you guys thanks a lot and, and uh, <laughs> let's see if there's a round two I mean, must the best story Billy Mayer Kubis Visa's last game it was against Otago and Kurs Visa was pushing 150 at this stage. And Kurs Visa was good on a forward ball, but when he went for a lob, and they got through the lob a bit too far, you know that where Beast holds the guys up and they go, ooh, look how strong he is. Now we had Kurs Visa. <laughs> Beast never lifted Kurs Visa. And the next minute, Kurs goes for a lob. And as he goes and he goes back, and he stretches, and Billy Mayer stands there and he looks up and he realizes, Kurs, this is your career or mine. And he walked away. <laughs> That was the last game. Kubis Visa played in New Zealand and never again. So that's the last one, guys. God bless. Nice chatting to you and let me know if you want to do some more. Yeah, this thanks a good very chat. much. Yeah, thanks, Ollie. It was great chat. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll definitely come back here for another time. I think close it maybe when we get back onto the field and there's some tests and you can get some around that. Perfect. God bless. Guys, enjoy thank COVID. You, thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers.